Brian Robert Setzer was born April 10, 1959 at Massapequa, Long Island in New York. He played horn in the school band, but was infatuated with the guitar sounds he heard at a very young age. He was brought up listening to his father's favorite music. Brian says, he played me Carl Perkins, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Johnny Cash. I thought, wow, I'd never heard anything like it. From there, Brian moved on to the likes of Eddie Cochran and Gene Vincent. He's into them in a big way. He said he wanted a guitar like Eddie Cochran and a hairstyle like Gene Vincent. He ended up getting both, and to top off the look, tattoos. He does take his dad's advice when getting tattooed. His dad told him, Never put anything where a judge can see it. If you have to go before a judge and he sees tattoos on your neck and hands, you don't stand a chance. Brian's first band was with his brother Gary on drums, a kind of new wave punk rock group called the Bloodless Pharaohs, and then later the Tomcats. After his brother Gary quit the Tomcats, as fate would have it, there was a couple of guys Brian had went to school with who only lived a few blocks from him, Leon Drucker and James McDonald. They were soon to get together over at Leon's house and start to play some music. Leon, later known as Lee Rocker, was playing stand-up double bass, and James, later on known as Slim Jim Phantom, downsized his drum kit and at Brian's urging started to stand up and play instead of sitting behind his drums. The music that came out was a rockabilly sound that hadn't been heard in 20 years. But the three kids were totally in love with the whole aspect of this style of music. From the looks and sound to the hot rods, motorcycles, and girls that went along with it. And the Tomcats became the Stray Cats. Brian went out and to get his sound found him a guitar just like Eddie Cochran. It was a 1959 Gretsch 6120 Chet Atkins model. Which by the way he still has today even though it has been lost a few times and even stolen once. He bought the guitar for a hundred bucks. Its electronics were in a shoe box as the guy who was selling it had taken it apart to refinish it. But Brian bought it on the spot. With the shoe box of electronics under one arm and the guitar body in his other hand, he took it home and put it all back together. He said it didn't even have a case at the time. He don't play it out much anymore for fear of it getting lost or stolen again. He says it's still the best sounding guitar out of the many he owns and plays today. By this time, Brian had vastly improved on his guitar sound and technique. The group had wrote a few original songs and were ready. They say luck is where preparation meets opportunity. Brian Lee and Slim Jim were well prepared and across the Atlantic, the opportunity was there and waiting. I think it was a mutual idea from all of us to go to England, Brian said. I remember paging through an English newspaper in a little magazine stand with a picture of some guy who had like a pompadour and an earring and a tattoo. At the time, it was the pre-punk days. It was so out of the ordinary. Nowadays, everybody's got that. It was such a fantastic thing to see that we just said, wow, and the word rockabilly was mentioned in the article. And then Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran, stuff we had discovered on our own that these guys were talking about. We just were blown away by it. No one where we came from had ever heard the word rockabilly. We were all between 18 and 20 years old. We didn't care. We sold everything we had and I mean everything. We had a little PA, we sold that. I sold guitars, Jim and Lee sold their stuff. We really pitched in to get enough to buy plane tickets. We left with just a Gretsch guitar, a stand-up bass, a drum and a cymbal, and a few clothes. They found a guy who managed them and he allowed them to stay at his parents' house just south of London. And within a year, they were to record their first album and start opening shows for the Rolling Stones. Brian tells this story about hanging out with Keith Richards. When I walked in his room, he was blasting the sun sessions. Then he handed me a gun and we went out and shot rats. That's pretty rockabilly, man. 
While playing a gig in London, they met producer Dave Edmonds. He offered to work with the group, and they entered the studio to record their self-titled debut album, released in England in 1981 on Arista. They were popular right out of the box, scoring three straight hits that year, with Runaway Boys, Rock This Town, and Stray Cat Strut. Their follow-up album wasn't as well received, and stung by the negative reviews, the Stray Cats decided to return to the States and make a go of it. The band was quickly signed by EMI America and in 1982 released their U.S. debut album, Built for Speed, which compiled the highlights from their two British LPs. Helped by the extensive airplay on MTV at the height of the Anything Goes New Wave era, Rock This Town and Stray Cat Strut both hit the American Top 10 over a year after their British chart peaks. As a result, Built for Speed was a hit, and their second album, Rant and Rave with the Stray Cats, appeared in 1983. And although it had a couple of songs do pretty good, as it happened over in England with their follow-up album, things just started to nosedive again. And so did things within the band. Like it or not, Brian became the focal point of the band. MTV brought out Brian front and center, and well-deserved, I would think, he was the lead vocalist, a very accomplished guitar player with a unique style for the times, and he had the look and attitude. Brian made guest appearances with stars like Bob Dylan and Stevie Nicks, and became the concert guitarist for Robert Plant's Honey Dripper's side project. In late 1984, Brian broke up the Stray Cats amid some bad blood. Lee and Slim Jim quickly went looking for another frontman and found Earl Slick and put a band back together. But it wasn't the same, and the band was over, for the time being. They would make attempts with a couple of different albums through the late 80s, but they never gained back the success as the early 80s brought them. They would keep on trying every once in a while to get something going right on up to 2020. But Brian kept his career going, he made an attempt to do a more roots rock album called The Knife Feels Like Justice, and it was okay. And the album did okay, but sometimes okay in this business means you better step back and take a look around. He did a good job portraying Eddie Cochran in the film La Bamba, and that film did a great job of keeping Brian's name out there. At that point in time, who else could you cast to play Eddie Cochran? Brian was a dead ringer for the guy, and it was a refreshing point in the movie watching someone who could actually play an instrument, taking nothing away from Lou Diamond Phillips, who I think did a great job of acting, although he left a lot to be desired when it came to acting like he could play a guitar. As the 90s rolled in, Brian got the idea to put together a big band, an orchestra with him, the guitarist, fronting the show and playing some big band sounds and songs. What made him decide to go in that direction? Growing up in New York, Brian was inspired by two memorable experiences that led to playing in an orchestra. As a teenager, with a fake ID, he was led into a club one night in Greenwich Village where he discovered the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Big Band. I wandered into this experience, and when I heard that sound, I was blown away, he said. I couldn't believe how good it sounded. Brian said that as a kid, he often stayed home to watch Doc Severinsen and the Tonight Show band on Johnny Carson. That was a different style, maybe a little more jazzy, it was a little more mainstream, but just as good. And I imagined myself up there with a guitar playing with the Tonight Show Orchestra. I was a little kid thinking about that. I got to meet Doc later on in life and I told him that. He said, geez, well, I wish we would have known we would have had you come up. Those two musical experiences in my life was what made me want to start the big band. Getting the Brian Setzer Orchestra going was no easy task. It was slow starting out. On their first gig at the theater that seated 500, 
Brian said there was about 30 people in the audience. We had more people on stage than we did in the audience. But the Brian Setzer Orchestra picked up steam and has kept Brian out there working and traveling all over the world. Their 1998 album, Dirty Boogie, had the Grammy award-winning cover of the Louis Prima song, Jump, Jive, and Whale. Brian has won a total of three Grammys. Between the orchestra and getting back with the Stray Cats once in a while, Brian has had a long and consistent career. They shut down for the pandemic and Brian said he needed the time off. He was having an issue with tinnitus, which is a ringing in the ears, that it sounded like a tea kettle whistling in his ear constantly. Looking on his webpage, I see no shows at all booked in 2023. Makes me wonder if we may have seen the last of him touring. He did release an album, Gotta Have the Rumble, in August of 2021, but he doesn't seem to be doing any live shows. Either way, he has left a good trail in the music business road. He brought back rockabilly music years after it was almost forgotten about. Then after that, he brought back the big band sounds. He has an uncanny way of going against the grain and coming out on the good side. One thing he had going for him was he had talent. He was a charismatic frontman. When the Stray Cats videos hit MTV, everyone was wanting to know who the guitar player and singer was. Brian Setzer, he got to play the music he wanted to play and made it work in a business that usually turns their back on someone who won't conform to their trends. So even if his touring days are over, I'm pretty sure he can look back and smile at his career. If you enjoy this video on Brian Setzer, give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more like it, hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notifications. Help the channel grow. Thanks for watching.